जन गण मन अधिनायक जय हे भारत भाग्य विधाता पंजाब सिंध गुजरात मराठा द्राविड उत्कल गंगा इंद्र हिमाचल यमुना गंगा उच्चल जल वितरंगा तब शुभ नामे जागे तब शुभ आशीष मागे Scott Summit, which brings to you the Arogya Setu dialogue today. Things may be possibly changed by the COVID-19 pandemic, and the economic and human fortune is likely to be immense in terms of years to come. Countries are fighting tooth and nail to protect the lives of their citizens, the lifeblood of their economies, and to secure their nation's future. National interest versus global cooperation is likely to be a significant theme in a post-COVID world. It will be every nation for itself, every economy for itself. As various countries struggle to enforce social distancing norms as a measure for disease prevention, one such digital solution appears to be contact tracing and social interaction mapping to help the spread of COVID-19. There are competing arguments for whether the government will. Competing arguments for whether the government or the private sector should be undertaking this measure. Several countries over the world have introduced such technological solutions, which empower governments to deliver targeted healthcare and prevent disease during this trying time. The Arogya Setu app is one such measure undertaken by the government of India. There are those which see immense potential in this app, which has gained a user base of 17 million users over a short span of time. These voices argue for the expansion of digital public health services such as triage and telemedicine. They see the Arogya Setu app as a tool in the hands of doctors. A tool in the hands of doctors and frontline workers for strategic and timely medical intervention. A means of potentially alleviating the stress on the public health care system and avoiding the spread of this disease thereby saving lives. There are also those who see this app as a means for state surveillance rather than a tool for fighting COVID-19. These voices argue that the privacy of citizens is at risk through the Arogya Setu app. They feel that the app violates certain legal principles, and they say that this app will open the door to large-scale monitoring of citizens by the state. They feel that a private sector alternative based on consent may be a better solution to fight the pandemic. In the hands of the government, these are significant and serious concerns raised by those who see potential for misuse in this app. It is important to address these concerns. It is equally important, given the magnitude of the lives, economic costs, and public health data at stake, to justify what other viable alternatives exist today, which allow nations and public healthcare systems to fight this virus and protect their citizens. The dimensions of this debate are therefore as follows: What is a better tool to fight the pandemic? A government one or one provided by the private sector? In case medical intervention is required, should it come from government, the private sector, or should it be left to the people? Is such an app a public service or a commercial one? Is tracking people through maps and miscellaneous applications a bad thing? What is the scope for expansion under the Arogya Setu app? What is the alternative available to this, and which one 
will help us fight the virus better. This, I open the panel for comments. I'm not sure if Mr. Arnab joined us yet. So let me take this opportunity to begin. I am here. Mr. Arnab Kumar is here. Great. So Mr. Arnab Kumar has been overseeing the app at the Niti IO. And I would like to invite him to make uh, a presentation on the Arogya Setu app, its genesis and its usability and features. Mr. Kumar. Yeah. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Rohan. Thanks a lot for that. <clears throat> and uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, uh, joining into this uh, discussion. Uh, Arogya Setu app had its genesis uh, in the mid-March when uh, we were seeing increasing numbers of uh, uh, <clears throat> of uh, positive cases and uh, countries across the globe, India included, was depending on <clears throat> a manual ways of doing contact tracing uh, for a country of the scale that India has and the, the space at which uh, the cases were uh, <clears throat> increasing, uh, manual contact tracing was absolutely not possible. Uh, we had seen some early designs from MIT, et cetera, on how to do this uh, automatically. This was a week before uh, Trace Together came, uh, came out. Uh, we were also on the similar lines, given India's scale, etc. Uh, we took about a couple of weeks more before we could release it. Uh, there were a couple of uh, design elements that were sacrosanct to us from day one. Uh, the first uh, design element that was sacrosanct to us, and I have seen a lot of uh, press uh, on this in the last few weeks, uh, was uh, the app or the mobile product should be privacy first by design. Uh, we have tried our best to stick to that. Uh, the second aspect was this should be available and, and applicable on every single smartphone in the country. So from day one itself, we were ready to uh, roll it out to 400 million smartphones if people downloaded, uh, 400 of us download it on day one. The third aspect that was this has to be a very, very inclusive and easy to use product. That is why you saw when we released on day one, we had 11 languages added. Uh, we added another language, which is uh, Assamese about three days ago. And we are in the process of rolling it out to all 22 scheduled languages in the country. I don't think any other app in the country has that. The fourth aspect was we, we uh, minimized the use of any third party software, which may open us to claims of we sharing data with anybody except the people that are mandated to work on <clears throat> uh, and people who are mandated to work on COVID-19 related medical interventions. So we built almost everything from ground up. This took us time, but trust me when I say this, about 50 engineers work 24 seven for approximately 15 days so that we do not have to rely on any third party software. Uh, call us paranoid, but we made sure that every single channel that we open for data to be processed, data to be accessed or data to be transferred is secured. There are absolutely no vulnerabilities. We actually had four different entities check for the security and privacy vulnerability of the app. We still are doing it. So almost on a daily basis, we are looking at open ports, et cetera, where this could be open to uh, vulnerabilities. Can we do privacy audit? Can we do security audit? We have all done that. While we were developing uh, an early beta version, we had given it to a bunch of technical hackers, et cetera, to see if there are any other vulnerabilities. Now, when it comes to privacy, uh, one thing that, and, and also the product when it comes okay, to uh, awesome. product, et cetera, uh, let me be very, very clear. Uh, we do not claim to have created a perfect product. We developed this in 10 days. We released it within two weeks <clears throat> of starting the concept. What I do promise you is that we are an evolving product and we are doing all incremental changes for, for the best of the country and for the best of the product. So you would have seen an update in the privacy policy. And by the way, there'll be another update in a few days from now where we are moving towards uh, a system which is uh, equitable, which is uh, taking care of your privacy, which makes sure that we, uh, we respect and we do not at any instance compromise on the personal information that you're sharing with us. There have been several comments about uh, certain things which I would request all of us to uh, go through 
the privacy policy, et cetera, and the design considerations of the app. And I'm happy to answer as many questions as possible. Let me be very, very clear on, on a few things. The first aspect is that the personal information that we ask of you is asked one time, is encrypted and put on the server. And in most of the cases, we will absolutely not use it at all. Uh, we have had several layers of encryption to make sure that it's almost impossible for you to know of someone's phone number and get all their personal information. By the way, the personal information that we are asking are name, age, sex, uh, countries that they have traveled in the past <clears throat> uh, 30 days, and whether they are ready to volunteer. Uh, it may very well be argued that all of them are needed at some stage to make sure that uh, your uh, chances of COVID risk infection when we are prioritizing whom to uh, administer medical intervention or not is absolutely needed. Uh, what I also request is when we uh, discuss is not to compare us to countries like Singapore. Uh, they have a population of 5 million. Uh, we reached 5 million within 10 hours of launch. That is something that is very, very important to understand. And the way things work in, in countries which may have far more digital capabilities that, than we have, or maybe uh, far less geographically diverse than we are, or people diverse than we are, uh, these things become important. For us, we have to solve for everything. Societal uh, good uh, has to be solved. Uh, ability to reach out to every single one of us in need of medical intervention is something that absolutely needs to be done. The second aspect of the data that we ask of you is the Bluetooth contact tracing. The contact tracing only happens on Bluetooth. Let me be very, very clear on this. This does not happen through GPS. And whatever we uh, ask of you on contact tracing is stored on your phone till the point in time you return COVID-19 positive, which means that if, only if you turn COVID-19 positive, I'm going to take a record of who all you have met in the past 14 days and calculate their risk of infection. And only for the purpose of uh, providing requisite medical interventions to those people. The third aspect is that the app asks for location at, at three specific points. The first point in when you are registering, this gets stored in the same encrypted server. The purpose of storing, asking for location is so that we know where all the downloads are and make sure that we try to reach to as many people as possible. The second is the self-assessment where we ask you for the location. And the third aspect is we ask for you, the location is captured when you meet somebody through Bluetooth contract tracing. All these three points, the location, is only used on an aggregated basis, not on an individual basis. We are here to create hotspots, etc. We are not going, or we are not interested in who you meet or why you meet or for how long have you met them. That's the second aspect. The third aspect, which people need to appreciate, is that we have a kill switch. The kill switch is what we store on the phone. It's deleted in 30 days. What we store on the server, we delete it in 45 days. And for COVID-19 positive patients, 60 days after they have been cured. Uh, I, will, I will request all of us learned people to point me to an app which actually gives you this explicit uh, understanding that we will delete you. Our philosophy, one of the important design principles is very, very simple. This is a temporary solution for a temporary problem. While we do understand that we may have built something which may be called a primitive health stack uh, for, for the country, uh, that may be pursued later, but minus all the things that we are asking for COVID-19. That is the second aspect. The third aspect is that nobody except people directly involved in COVID-19 medical intervention and planning have access to this information. Let's be rest assured about that. Uh, we have very secure VPN tunnels through which access is given to people of the information that we have collected from our citizens on a need to know basis. And we have a complete audit of who has access data, who has downloaded even a single piece of information. So that comfort is there. Uh, <clears throat> we are very, very conscious of what new scopes and, and, and features we add to this. Uh, I don't say this lightly when I tell you that I almost get five calls every day, people asking me to increase the scope to do even more radical things with this app. And you have no idea how difficult it is for me to keep telling them, no, I cannot do that. That is not the purpose of the app. Uh, the, the, the spirit of the product is contact tracing, making sure that you break, we all together break the chain of COVID-19 infection and nothing else. These are my opening remarks. If you have specific points, I'm happy to engage in a more nuanced manner, but uh, take it from uh, people like us who have seen both the private side and the public side. Privacy first is something that we do not say lightly. It's not a jingo or it's not a tagline for us. We actually believe in it. And that is why we, we are super paranoid when we are building the product. We are super paranoid when we are extending the product for anything else. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Mr. Kumar. Am I audible now? I believe there was a technical challenge. Yeah, much better now. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. I'm quickly going to repeat my opening remarks for the benefit of everyone attending this panel before I move on to Mr. Prashant Sugathan. Uh, the dimensions of this debate are two competing arguments presented on either side. One side believes that this app is a means for state surveillance rather than a tool for fighting COVID-19. These voices argue that the privacy of citizens is at stake through the Aroge Setu app. They feel that the app violates certain legal principles. They say that this app will open the door for large-scale monitoring of citizens by the state. They feel that a private sector alternative based on consent may be a better solution to fight the pandemic rather than putting too much power in the hands of the government. The other side believes that the Aroge Setu app is one such measure for disease prevention taken by the government of India as has been done by various countries through contract tracing and social interaction mapping. They see immense potential in this app which has gained a user base of 70 million over a short span of time. And they argue for the expansion of digital health services such as triage and telemedicine like Mr. Kumar pointed out through this application. They see the Arogya Setu app as a tool in the hands of doctors and frontline workers for strategic and timely medical intervention and a means for potentially alleviating the stress on the public healthcare system and avoiding further spread of disease. It's important to address both these concerns. It's important given the magnitude of the lives, economic costs and public health data at stake to justify what other viable alternatives exist today, which will allow nations and public healthcare systems to fight this virus and protect their citizens. The dimensions of the debate therefore are as follows. What is a better tool to fight the pandemic? A government one or one provided by private sector? In case medical intervention is required, should it come from the government, the private sector, or should it be left to the discretion of the patient? Is such an app a public service or a commercial one? And is tracking people through maps and miscellaneous apps a bad thing? What is the scope for expansion under the Arogya Setu app and what are the alternatives available to this? Which one will help us fight the virus better? Mr. Prasant Sugathan is volunteer legal director at Software Freedom Law Center in New Delhi and has worked extensively on internet laws. I would now like to invite him for his remarks, Mr. Sugathan. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. And thanks, Arna, for the opening remarks and make it make it very clear the kind of issues that you grapple with when you are developing the app. So let me make this very clear at the onset. See, we are all in this together and any debate or any discussion should be seen in that light. Now for any initiative from the government to great, greater adoption, the initiative should inspire trust. Trust is an important aspect, again, when we are fighting this pandemic. So that is one important reason when we at SFLC pointed out the need for the code base, the software to be open source. One important aspect there is that when the code is open source, it ensures that the developer community from both India and abroad can participate in the development. This ensures that security audit of the code is there at each and every stage of development. Now, keeping the project as closed source, on the other hand, goes against this and their policy on adoption of open source, the open source policy, which has been followed by the government. Moreover, if you look at the terms of service and terms of the app as such, it specifically says that instead of encouraging security audit, this security audit itself is discouraged as the terms prevent reverse engineering. That's the important concern that we have because reverse engineering, it is important if a security audit has to happen. This is, uh, I mean, uh, for everyone's uh, reverse engineering is a process through which one can study a computer program, understand how it works, and also to find out is it exactly what the app developer is saying that it uh, does, or is, it, is there something more to it? But that is very important when we are using an app like this, which also has, as we, all of us understand, that it also has the potential to be a mass surveillance tool. And that is where it will be very important to ensure that the app is very secure and it does only what it uh, says that it does. So that's one issue number one. Now, again, when it comes to reverse engineering, this is something which is even permitted by the Copyright Act. Now, when the statute provides that, provides for reverse engineering, it's unfortunate that the terms of service of a government app was exactly against it 
and has a clause which prevents reverse engineering. Now, another major issue uh, that I just want to point out, there are like a few major things. I'm sure Siddharth will be looking, uh, pointing out and looking into the issues of proportionality in a city, etc. I wanted to figure out, I mean, point out a major important aspects before we get into those issues. One is with respect to the mission creep of this application. So an app which started as something voluntary, a voluntary contact tracing app, is now slowly morphing into a multi-purpose app. When the app is extended for functions like ePass, the app becomes a de facto mandatory app. That is a problem. What was initially uh, kind of explained, uh, promoted as a voluntary app, and if you make that a de facto mandatory app, then it becomes prob problematic. And this definitely will affect the trust factor and also will affect the adoption. Okay, when the app, uh, I mean, uh, when people start using it for functions like e passes, the risk of false positives also became very large. We all know what happened in China, where people who are all, even COVID negative, they are considered to be in the risk category because of some issues with the app. We don't want that to happen in India, where the just because, as, I mean, uh, somebody, because of a false uh, positive, a person could be treated as to belong to the risk category and could be denied access maybe to his workplace, maybe to a public transport system, things like that. That's something that we need to be very careful about. This also is a problem when we look at the issue of surveillance. When government recently came up with a tender on patient tracking software, which reads cell tower dumps, gateway dumps and even has mobile forensic capabilities. Now, these are the kind of issues, uh, let's say issues, which does not instill any confidence for the citizen. So when you come up with an app I mean, or a software, which is called a patient tracking software, and it has capabilities for things like gateway dumps, mobile forensic capabilities, and then definitely this is problematic. Also, uh, and even if you look at the kind of servers and services, which is uh, which the app list talks to. I, mean, I don't personally consider it a problem of using a cloud service. Most of the apps will be using some cloud service like AWS or various other cloud services. But the problem here was that Meti in a statement filed before the Kerala High Court that in the litigation with respect to a service used by the Kerala government, specifically said that only state data centers or national centers should be used while handling sensitive personal data by handling citizen data. But that goes against what is done in the case of Arugya Sedo. I mean, uh, uh, the person from ETI can correct me. But when we uh, tried to figure out uh, how the communication happened, we found that AWS is being used, Google Firebase is used. I'm not saying that it is definitely this can be done. But when Meiti comes up with a statement before a, a high court and states that this cannot be done, and when they themselves do it, this raises serious issues. So. The bottom line is this, it's important for the government to make sure that whatever steps are taken, this can garner trust of the citizens. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Sugathan. Uh, we now come to Siddharth Deb, who's Policy and Parliamentary Counsel at Internet Freedom Foundation, where he's written two extensive papers on the privacy issues surrounding the Arogya Setu app. Siddharth, if I can request you to keep your comments targeted and brief in the interest of time, over to you. Sure, I'll be as brief as possible. Firstly, I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Kumar with respect to his statement that, you know, the app is a work in progress and there will be an effort to improve the system as we go along. But uh, just even when it comes to the actual deployment of the system itself, uh, uh, Mr. Kumar mentions that, you know, in 15 days, they started writing the code and then it was available for download on Play Store and App Store within 15 days. And a, 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 a good, a positive way to describe this is, oh, there is agility and innovation, but let's just juxtapose how, uh, how it works in an allied discipline when, with respect to responding to this COVID-19 crisis, which is biomedicine. Slowly, the world is becoming intimately familiar with the fact that uh, the, the development of a vaccine will take probably 18 months and then several months longer for that vaccine to actually scale and have the requisite production to meet demand, right? And that means there is a prolonged sort of period under which there will be multiple uh, trials, 
which uh, with respect to uh, to ensure the quality assurance of the vaccine which is developed and uh, to ensure that a safe product eventually hits the market that phenomenon is not novel to just medicine but we can also see that in other sectors as well such as automobiles or even uh, uh, automobile manufacturing or even let's say a, a social science discipline like psychology where before you administer a certain test you need to get your proposal vetted by an ethics board now in conjunction uh, in contrast when you look at information and communication technologies there is degree of regulatory immaturity which subsists because of which technological solutionism is a lot easier for uh, for not just governments but for private sector to also deploy where in let's say two weeks a, a product has already hit mark the market and there aren't enough essentially checks and balances which are being uh, which have been put in place to ensure that a safe uh, a, a product is actually being used by users now why, why does that sort of uh, 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 prevail well there are deficits on uh two fundamental levels one is legal and one is institutional we have to understand that the the use of a contact tracing solution like uh, like the arogya setu app is and necessarily will be a restriction to people's right to privacy does that mean that a government can't use technology at all while responding to a public health crisis the answer is no that's not what someone from civil society like us is saying but it's a question of figuring out how a government can utilize technology to respond to the public health crisis yet within the wire frame of uh, the protections which are afforded by the constitution of india now with respect to any restriction to the right to privacy even when it is under emergency circumstances it needs to satisfy certain thresholds the first is that any such deployment of technology must necessarily happen under a viable law legal regime which is ideally there should be a law which regulates or protects people's privacy and then therefore allow certain exceptions under which the government can use technology which may restrict someone's privacy to some extent or the other unfortunately we don't have an adequate uh, data protection or surveillance law which is consistent with our right to privacy as of now because our laws which were framed were uh, were uh, are old and archaic and not consistent with these standards so now what is the alternative that we unfortunately have which is the only fetters on government's use of these systems are unfortunately governed by contract which is a terms of service and a privacy policy that in itself puts india at a uniquely disadvantaged situation where we don't have an actual legal framework uh to hold the government accountable to ensure that people and you need those external checks and balances to be able to hold the government accountable when they are using these systems thank you so it, thank you sadar okay. we'll come back to you uh, during the discussion in q and a i would now like to invite ms pratibha jain who's partner at nishit desai associates and heads the delhi office for her inputs ms jain thanks rohan um and firstly thank you anup for uh, outlining the process through which uh, the government came up with the app and congratulations uh, i think you know um, these are unprecedented times and the effort that the government has taken to provide a balance in terms of uh, uh, privacy and encryption in the app um, and providing trust to consumers um, and citizens uh while you know meeting the requirement for emergency measures required in a time like this i think it's really commendable um let me just deal with the legal arguments first neither of the panelists right now really gave me any legal argument for why the app does not meet the legal requirements either under current indian laws proposed indian laws constitutional law or international law now um in paucity of time i'm not going to go through because that is not anybody's argument that it does not meet the requirements of either the information technology act which is the current law dealing with privacy or the proposed bill for data protection which clearly has an exemption for the circumstances that prevail today in which this app is being introduced given that it neither violates either of those two 
um, let's look at does it provide um, you know would, would it meet a constitutional challenge and an international law challenge even in international principles if you look at the Syracuse principles for limitation and derogation of provisions in the international covenant on civil and political rights clearly there, it has been mentioned that public health may be invoked as a ground for limiting certain rights in order to allow a state to take measures dealing with serious threat to health of the population or individual members of the population. And um, similarly, uh, 39A provides a state party may take measures derogating from its obligations under international covenants on civil and political rights when faced in a situation of exceptional and actual or imminent danger, which threatens the life of the nation. So by any measures, uh, the pandemic today would have met uh, all of these uh, tests under international law. Now, I am typically, and in uh, you know previous coach debates, you have seen me argue very strongly for um, rights of privacy and uh, the importance of, you know, limiting uh, government actions as far as um, uh, anything that threatens rights to privacy of citizens are concerned. Um, but at the same time, you know, any, anybody who understands the importance of government intervention in times like these um, will understand that an, an app like this where you know you have somebody from Niti Ayogan coming and explaining the measures that have been taken. They could have easily undertaken um, a measure where it was compulsory to having to download this app on your smartphones. They could have taken other uh, emergency measures, but they have outlined the steps that they have taken to ensure your data is encrypted, to ensure your data is deleted, and to ensure there is a balance in terms of the kind of information that has been asked and the anonymization of that data. So what, what you're asking is name, age, sex, and you know, your health status and where you have traveled. And the fact, um, as Arnav had mentioned, various specific time periods after which the information is deleted. Um, I think the success and the trust that uh, they've been able to garner because of the balance that they've provided uh, in terms of ensuring right to privacy of the citizens is provided in the, the success in the download of the app. I will stop here for now, but I, I, let, me, let me just give you examples of today, because we're a socialist country, because we have government intervening at the right times, um, you are able to come up with an app so quickly. And I know it was done with the help of the private sector. It wasn't done something you know, without the help of the private sector. But I am actually quite thankful that if tech can be produced in India with the help of private sector so quickly and implemented, I would actually laud the government for that. The only one thing I would say, uh, Rohan, is uh, the privacy policy, last I checked, it doesn't limit which arms of the government can have access to data. If it can be specifically provided that it will be limited to the health ministry or people working on uh, issues related to the pandemic, I think that would give added comfort. Thank you very much, Ms. Jain. And I, and I hope that that point which you raised on which arms of the government will have access to this data will be discussed later during this panel. Uh, I'd now like to invite Mr. Tushar Sanu, who's uh, an advocate at the Delhi High Court, to share his views on the Arogya Setu app. Yes, hi. Thanks, Rohan. And hi, everyone. Uh, the, you know, the modalities of uh, the app have been very astutely explained by Mr. Arnab. Congratulations to him. Mr. Sogathan has, on the other hand, uh, you know, expressed his concern very vocally, and they've been, uh, you know, prevalent in these times. Uh, Ms. Jain has explained the constitutional framework as also the international law principles governing the app. As far as I am concerned, I will limit this, uh, uh, you know, my uh, my my time allotted to the actual uh, uh, legal framework within which this app operates. Now it has been contended by, you know, in the public discourse of this app that uh, this uh, operates in a legal vacuum and that there is no legal framework governing this app. 
you know in this regards firstly we must we all appreciate that personal information is a manifestation of an individual's personality and the supreme court has held that the right to privacy is an integral part however that fundamental right is obviously subjected to and fettered with the compelling reasons of state and security public health public interest etc it has been held in kharak singh gobind r rajgopal pucl i am sure you are all very learned and very well aware that uh, uh, you know the, the it has been held to be a fundamental right and it cannot be fettered away at the at, at at anybody as at anybody's wishes now as far as the legal framework is concerned the I, there are basically you know my research tells me and uh, you know my common knowledge as far as a litig as far as a litigation lawyer is concerned is that uh, you know the frame there might not be a data privacy law as of now but uh, the framework in terms of the statutes that exist today for example the it act the indian penal code the copyright act and uh, you know another so, so, some one one more provision is there especially in the it act section 75 79 65 and 66 specifically covers breach of data and the consequences criminal oblique penal thereof the monetary penalties and fines that will be imposed as far as the indian penal code is concerned section 4 403 specifically deals with dishonest misappropri misappropriation or conversion of movable property property for one's own use which is applicable in this case it calls for by the way uh, 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 criminal punishment and fine as far as the uh, you know these databases being intellectual property are concerned the copyright acts in section 63b imposes criminal punishment in from the forms of imprisonment as also monetary fines and penalties now this is as far as the statutory framework is concerned so you know you know for 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 the argument that this operates in a legal vacuum is somehow misplaced as far as i am concerned though i could stand corrected by the learned legal minds here otherwise but that is point number 1 point number 2 is the recent challenge to these the framework of such apps which are primarily contact tracing which uh, you know uh, use technology as a medium is as uh, you know we are all aware it's in the news lately the bala gopala krishnan versus the state of kerala case properly known as the sprinkle deal case now in that case i believe yesterday or day before the kerala high court in a marathon 4 hour hearing uh you know pointed out and directed a, a couple of important directions in in the app that the kerala government through sprinkler is using i'll just enumerate two three because they are very relevant for this app and for this debate and number one is that the government of kerala was directed to anonymize all data you know as far as the deal is concerned as far as the sprinkler app is concerned here it has already been done uh, in terms of arogya setu number number 2 is that the there should be no disclosure to any third party entity it is already there in the arogya setu number 3 is it injuncts the uh, the you know the app makers from advertising or promoting the database that is already there implicit in this uh, in the terms and conditions of arogya setu number 4 is that uh, it cannot exploit data intentionally indirectly or directly so you know if one goes through those the, you know the order i believe it was uh, yesterday's order the all the points that the honorable high court has 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 directed to the kerala government already stand incorporated in aragya setu app so as far as i am concerned and my limited understanding is that it does not fall afoul of the statutory framework as it exists in india there are sufficient legal safeguards and it is i believe the frontline weapon in 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 the fight against corona virus which by the way is putting our democracy in peril thank there you. is absolutely absolutely no uh, two rounds of water thank you so thank much thank you thank you very much tushar for sharing your views i now like to invite ms devdat mukhopadhyay who's associate counsel litigation and rti at the internet freedom foundation to share her inputs hi rohan uh, thanks for having me here I think my areas of expertise are constitutional law and public law so I'd like to look at this issue from an institutional perspective of separation of powers during public health emergencies we see that there is a tendency of concentration of power in the hands of the executive branch 
And this is partly understandable because you need to grant a certain degree of discretion to executive officials to take urgent decisions because of the time sensitive nature of the COVID-19 outbreak. However, this does not mean that other branches of government, namely the parliament and the judiciary, do not have a role to play anymore. Um, there's been a lot of conversation uh, before this about you know, function creep and how the Arogya Setu app, which was originally intended to only be a contact tracing app, may be made mandatory for other purposes as well, including to get an e-pass or to maybe access public transport. That is something of serious concern because only one third Indians actually own smartphones. So if having access to a smartphone and access to the Arogya Setu app is made a mandatory condition for, for availing various uh, facilities and services, it will have a massive exclusionary impact. And I think this is where there is need for you know, some degree of parliamentary oversight and scrutiny. I recognize that the parliament is currently not in session, but the government still does retain its ordinance making powers. And ordinances are subject to some degree of parliamentary oversight because they have to be ratified by the parliament after the parliament resumes functioning. In this case, particularly, it would be very beneficial if something like the Arogya Setu exercise, which seeks to collect sensitive health data of millions of Indian citizens, had some underlying legislative basis. This legislative basis could guarantee then that the app and the data that has been collected by it will not be used for any other purposes once the pandemic is over. So basically a sunset clause. It could also uh, sort of specify, as has been previously suggested, that only health officials and not law enforcement officials will have access to people's health and movement data. I think putting this in the form of a legislation will give people a lot more uh, comfort and will encourage people to trust the government and the app more because it's not it's very easy to change the privacy policy or terms of conditions whereas something which goes through parliament has greater sanctity um just one more point on the role of the judiciary i think since the parliament is currently not in session it's especially imperative for the judiciary to step in if it thinks uh, that people's fundamental rights are being violated by executive excesses during this time and the role of the judiciary to be very honest is tricky because it has to safeguard rights without encroaching into the policy making domain of the executive and i think the kerala high court decision which has been previously mentioned by other panelists as well shows the right way forward because what the Kerala High Court does is that it says that, listen, if the government's telling us that it needs the services of Sprinkler to combat the pandemic, we're not going to second guess that judgment. But we will rigorously interrogate the process through which the government has selected the Sprinkler platform and for what reasons. And I think that's a very good way to go about it because, I mean, it's a very famous quote in Indian constitutional law that the history of justice is also the history of, you know, insistence on adherence to procedure. And I think we should not be short-sighted and circumvent sort of existing systems of checks and balances even during these times. So those are just some preliminary re remarks and I'd be happy to add more during the Q&A. Rohan, can I make one limited point, like 30 seconds? Yes, yes, yes of course, Mr. Yeah, so <clears throat> one thing that I've heard over and over again is scope creep and e-pass. Uh, this is very uh, misunderstood, completely misunderstood. Please understand that the Arogya Setu app is in integration with EPAS, not an origination of EPAS. So this is completely misunderstood. There's an FAQ, please read it. People who have been issued EPASs by the state governments is integrated here. It is not an origination mechanism. So, so that, that argument is not valid at all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kumar, for that clarification. And I think that there have been some very interesting legal arguments on both sides. Let's also, at this stage of the discussion, try and understand the use case for the Arogya Setu app as a response to this disaster. We have Mr. Satya Narayan Pradhan with us, who's Director General of the National Disaster Response Force, the NDRF. May I please request Mr. Pradhan uh, for his presentation? Mr. Pradhan? Hi. Hi. Good afternoon, Rohan, and good afternoon, all the panelists. Uh, I, as you can understand, I'm in the business of disaster response. And I'm also a cop, a policeman, a law enforcement uh, person. Uh, person. And I know that law enforcement is most usual of the usual suspects in the terms of privacy versus the government. And uh, we have already heard arguments in this panel saying that whatever happens, the data must not go into the hand of the law enforcement. You know, that is that is very well taken. Being a law enforcement personnel, I, I think the limitation does apply and it doesn't, it doesn't really concern us right now. But I have the argument that I'm going to make is from the disaster response point of view. 
the first thing I must say, and all the three points I'm going to make are macro points. The first thing I must say is across the world, the disaster response law ecosystem to be otherwise called the humanitarian law ecosystem, which is based on the Geneva principles, nowhere is privacy embedded in the disaster response law ecosystem. So it is the same for India. And there was some surprise uh, I saw in the media that instead of the Epidemic Act, the Disaster Management Act has been invoked, 2005 has been invoked. Disaster Management Act is the act of which the NDR of which I had is the product. So yes, this is the disaster we are facing and disaster by the nature of uh, it are governance emergencies. You know, all of us understand because we are in the business of human rights and privacy, et cetera, we understand that all the rights lie against the state. And when the state is faced with an emergency, the toss up is between competing rights. It is not as if privacy is an absolute standalone right. There are many rights and even privacy has been collated or co-located within the rights of uh, life and property by the Honorable Supreme Court, life and uh, liberty, uh, Article 21. So you can see that it is a contested space and at any point of time, there has to be a priority fixed on what to do. And there is this classic, inter uh, you know, just a position of freedom to and freedom from. And you, it is anybody's guess the migrant who is walking away to his home a thousand miles away, is he looking at freedom to privacy or freedom from some deprivation? So it, it, what, what I'm saying is I don't, I am not about to dismiss privacy. Privacy is very much sacrosanct, is, is part of the complementary ecosystem. But then sometimes you have to interplay and see what is, what is to be addressed immediately. And probably, as far as Arugya Setu is concerned, speed and scale was of great importance. And I'm, I'm very happy that Arnav explained the whole aspect and also said, or almost implied that it is not as if privacy is being targeted here. Privacy first is still part of the embedded design of that. And while we were still discussing, he did the message that uh, the reverse engineering is being taken out, one of the objections, also that the, the open source is being opened up again for scrutiny. So everything is a, is a work in progress. And uh, I, I, I call this the fallacy of finality. You know, the, the, the principles of legality, necessity, proportionality, and safeguards, they are not final principles. They, it is not as if they are etched in stone and you have to just put the uh, Arugya Sethu into that framework, which is ready and uh, fixed. That also is a work in progress. Even the courts have interpreted it severally in different times. And it is the world over. It is not as if in disaster response everywhere things are settled. And I would like to read out something which is from the International Red Cross Handbook of Handbook on Data Protection in Humanitarian Action, which is very relevant here. I, I must read this out before I sign off. It says compliance with personal data protection standards requires taking into account the specific scope and purpose of humanitarian activities to provide for the urgent and the basic needs of vulnerable individuals. Data protection and humanitarian action should be seen as compatible, complementary to, and supporting each other. Thus, data protection should not be seen as hampering the work of humanitarian organizations. On the contrary, it should be of service to their work equally. Data and this I, I'd like you to focus on equally data protection principles should never be interpreted in a way that hampers essential humanitarian work and should always be interpreted in a way that furthers the ultimate objective of humanitarian action, namely safeguarding the life, integrity and dignity of the victims of humanitarian emergencies. So they are complementary principles. And I again assert that it is not a finished product. Neither is Arogya Setu a finished product, nor are the principles by which we argue in the courts a finished product, nor are the, the, the depositions in the court or the, or the decrees by the court a finished product. And that is happening across the world. If it were not so, the privacy principles must not be uh, uh, an issue which is coming up on the portals of the court again and again. again, and again. So Thank just you. to sum up one line, last line, 
that disaster response vis-a-vis -vis protection of private data and privacy is a work in progress, but that does not give the uh, excuse that you must always see a sinister design in the government plans. Thank you very much, Mr. Pradhan, for sharing those interesting perspectives on the Arogya Setu app and its usability. I'd now like to invite Dr. Uh, Pavan Duggal, who's an advocate at the Supreme Court of India, who specializes in cyber law. He's founder chancellor of the Cyber Law University and has worked extensively in the field. May I please request uh, Dr. Pavan Duggal to share his views at this stage of the discussion? Hi, Rohan. Uh, hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to listen to everybody's perspectives. I think we are in this all together. We are all uh, wanting to make India a more safe, a more healthy place. But when one looks at the Arogya Setu app, while it's a quantum leap forward, it has certain chinks in the armor. The first things first, the government in its terms and conditions says, I am not going to be liable for any unauthorized access of your data. That's the first fundamental alarm signal that begins to start uh, ringing in your mind when you start reading these terms and conditions and privacy policy. Here is a government who's fighting a pandemic, who's dealing with sensitive personal data, and who's washing its hands off to say, I'm not going to be liable for unauthorized access. And when one delves deeper into the scenario, one quickly realizes that uh, there are logical reasons for this particular stand. The reasons for this are that, uh, number one, the app does not daily comply with the parameters of existing law being the Information Technology Act 2000, as also the Information Technology Intermediary Guidelines Rules 2011, as also the Information Technology Reasonable Security Practices and Procedures and Sensitive Personal Data or Information Rules 2011. I extensively went through the terms and conditions, the privacy policy, just to you know, find myself, satisfy myself as to where I'm able to find these compliances or how the app is saying it's compliant. It's not compliant because if it was complying, it would have said that so in the requisite documents. So just because it's a pandemic, does that mean we throw the existing jurisprudence and the law out of the uh, out of the window purely on the ground that we are fighting a pandemic? I think the answer is no. When I look at global scenarios and India is an integral part, I'm beginning to see the emergence of the new cyber world order where states are getting increasingly powerful and are using governance tools like COVID-19 apps for the purpose, purposes of further strengthening the state power. I think in a scenario like this, there's need for far more transparency. Just because we are in emergency mode does not mean that we don't comply with existing law. Otherwise, we could all shut down the existing legal processes and say, look, everything is suspended. We only talk about the pandemic and nothing else. It's number two, I think the cyber legal uh, ramifications get even more enhanced when one begins to examine how this particular law is doing service to cybersecurity. First and foremost, parameters of cybersecurity are uh, not mentioned. Maybe they're brilliant, but I don't get them on the document. Number two, it's still not sure how this particular app complies with reasonable security practices and procedures as are mandated under Section 43A of the Information Technology Act 2000. It's not even stated that how this particular app is even defining and complying with rule eight of the information technology, reasonable security practices and procedures and sensitive personal data or information rules 2011. Merely saying your data is secure, merely saying that I'm using encryption without letting us know what levels of encryption are you using from where, which point to which point is encryption being done? What kind of cybersecurity parameters have been incorporated in the said uh, app, which is no normal app. I think those are important issues that require consideration because at the end of the day, it's just not normal information that you're dealing with. You're dealing with sensitive personal data because all this information is uh, nothing but medical data. Further, by asking the users to put your geolocation on and uh, Bluetooth on, you're not only monitoring them, you're also monitoring others. The question is whether there's a mandate that's given by parliament under any law prevailing for the time being in force for the government to go ahead and do this is again a very, very gray area question. Because after the Supreme Court has held that your right to uh, privacy is a part of your fundamental right under Article 21 of the Constitution, such a right can only be deprived except in accordance with procedure established by law. 
As of now, when we talk, there is no procedure established by parliament in this regard, authorizing the government to do what it has done. So therefore, it's nothing but, uh, as I say, it's a pandemic uh, adventurism that's begun to start happening. And I think without even compliance with basic parameters of law, it could potentially uh, have a ripple effect in terms of massively increasing uh, the litigation of the government. Merely because the government saying in the terms and conditions, I'm not going to be responsible for unauthorized usage is not going to uh, may be of any substantial benefit because that's not going to stop people from going ahead and filing writ petitions in different parts of the country per se. I want the government to focus on uh, proactive transparency. Mm -hmm. It's a great service. It is required. It's the need of the hour. Just have it beefed up with appropriate compliances yeah. so that the confidence level of people is far more on a higher level than we deal with this scenario. And the biggest question, the app and its terms and conditions are, and privacy policy are completely silent as to who all is accessing the app, which all government agencies are accessing. This is an app of what? Ministry of uh, Electronics Information Technology. It's not an app of Ministry of Health. We don't know which all governmental agencies or state actors are having access to how the said data has been detailed. Well, Thank what's been said is... Thank you very much, Dr. Bukhar. Thank you. Uh, Thank you for sharing these interesting perspectives on encryptions and cyber law ramifications. Uh, it was really interesting to hear some of these. I'd now like to invite Major General Narendra Kumar of Lex Concilium Foundation, who's also a senior lawyer, to share his views on the Aroge Setu app and its use. Hello, everyone. The purpose of surveillance by this app is meant for the protection of citizens against coronavirus. The aim is thus lawful, necessary, and proportionate. I would explain this in little detail. It has the requisite sunset clause. The data collected from a person The data collected from a person and not uploaded, it has been stated, will be purged after 30 days if a person is not tested positive. On the other hand, for a person who tests positive, the data will be uploaded on the server. It will be purged 60 days later after the patient is cured. Thus, the shelf life is limited and distinct. There are no valid grounds so far to fear the use of data would be for a purpose beyond COVID-19. Measures are in place towards compliance of data security and anonymity. Eligibility of all citizens to get the app does away with any scope for discrimination and marginalization. Data sharing with third parties is not envisaged. Similarly, there are safeguards against abuse and right of citizens to respond to any abuse. Meaningful participation of all stakeholders has been ensured by opening up for comments. We've heard about this and it's a work in progress. All suggestions received are promptly and regularly attended to. The authorities have kept in mind the judgments in the Aadhaar case uh, and also of Justice Case Puttaswamy with regard to use and protection of data and also the right to privacy. Various aspects that featured in these two judgments were examined from the standpoint of data minimization, purpose limitation, time period for data retention, data protection, and security. We also got to keep in mind that uh, the right to privacy, which came up during the Aadhaar court, uh, during the Aadhaar case judgment, Justice uh, Case Puttaswamy was not dealing with the situation of pandemic. Uh, which is in hand here. So the triple test that was there, and some of the speakers before me have talked about the need for a law, is not to be read here. Now, certain other apprehensions have been expressed by the speakers before me. I'll try and respond to them. It has been said that the user data faces risk of being compromised. It is also alleged that there is no limit on the information that the government may seek. Now, both these points at this stage are purely speculative and therefore need no rebuttal. It is noteworthy that being fully transparent 
and constructive in approach, the authorities have already introduced a number of improvements within the short span life of this product. A view was also shared by one of the speakers that this mobile app be made compulsory for all to carry. Well, that would entail all to be issued with an Android phone, which is presently beyond the reach of millions in India. Some are of the view that persons who are young and IT savvy may hesitate to accept Bluetooth in their mobiles due to security implications in doing so. Therefore, it is urged that the concerned IT experts may wish to appropriately address this aspect. Can the GPS tracking be the remedy? I say so because all smartphones have inbuilt embedded GPS chips in them. Well, this could be examined. The acceptance of the app so far has been based on voluntary registration. Now, I move a step beyond. The possibility of the pandemic assuming alarming shape cannot be entirely ruled out. There may also be similar or other major diseases emerging in future. The state may then be saddled with a huge health hazard to face. Secondly, unity, integrity, security, and fraternity in the context of we the people may stand seriously threatened. In that scenario, the state would be duty bound to restrict, curtail, and regulate the movement of the people as may appear necessary to arm itself with the requisite constitutional authority to face, to face such a daunting task, it would be advisable to design suitable statutory measures for surveillance, restrict movement, and protect the health of citizens, including medical personnel. Hence, desirability of introducing a suitable ordinance preceded by an informed debate may be examined at an appropriate stage. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, as was mentioned in the background, in a post-COVID world, national interest versus global cooperation is likely to be a prevalent theme. So much so that today countries are fighting for resources to combat this virus. On that note, I'd like to bring in Dr. Ashwini Mahajan who is the national convener of the Swadeshi Jagran Manch to share his inputs on protecting India and its interests in a post-COVID world and during the crisis. Dr. Mahajan. Well, uh, thank you, Rohan. Uh, we were discussing about, uh, and we have been discussing about this uh, Aroge Setu app. And, uh, uh, in the beginning, I would say uh, thank you to all uh, all those who are opposing Arogya Setu app uh, for uh, having uh, compromised, uh, so-called compromised the uh, privacy and uh, other things. I want to ask them one thing. क्या ये अचानक उनको अभी पता चला कि ये प्रिवेसी कहीं ना कहीं हमारी कॉम्प्रोमाइज हो रही है आ, इन एप्स के माध्यम से इतने वर्षों से व्हाट्सएप चल रहा है फेसबुक चल रहा है उनके पास इतना हमारा डाटा रहता है और उस डाटा का यूज और मिसयूज वो करते ही रहते हैं उस समय तक ये कितनी जो क्लॉजेस हमने अभी सुनी है आ, नियमों के कानूनों के अंतर्गत क्या वो क्लॉजेस उन पर लागू नहीं होती हैं तो क्या ये आरोग्य सेतु ऐप जो इस समय इन विशेष परिस्थितियों में लाई गई है क्या केवल उसी समय ये आ, ये जो नियमों के बारे में हवाले दिए जाते हैं तभी दे जाएंगे मैं उनसे निवेदन करना चाहता हूं मैं उनका धन्यवाद भी करता हूँ कि उन्होंने इस, इस प्रकार की इसका इतना कानूनी अध्ययन भी किया है कि इसके कारण क्या क्या चीजें हमारी प्रिवेसी कहीं ना कहीं भंग हो रही है मैं उन सब मित्रों से ये भी पूछना चाहता हूं कि उनका कहना है कि ये जीपीएस सर्वेलेंस वगैरह से हमारी प्रिवेसी कहीं ना कहीं भंग होगी तो क्या ये बाकी सब जितनी एप्स हैं क्या उनसे नहीं होती थी कि केवल अभी होनी शुरू हुई है मुझे याद पड़ता है राजीव गांधी के जमाने में एक 
पोस्टल एक्ट आया था और उसके अंतर्गत सरकार के पास ये अधिकार आ जाता कि वो किसी की भी चिट्ठी पढ़ खोल करके पढ़ सकता है और उस समय के जो हमारे राष्ट्रपति थे ज्ञानी जय सिंह उन्होंने उस बिल को पारित नहीं किया होने दिया और उसको उसको अनुमति नहीं दी और वापस भी नहीं भेजा ताकि वो छह महीने में अपने आप ही वो बिल समाप्त हो जाए और उसको वो नियम कानून ना बनने पाए लेकिन उसके बाद आज के इस साइबर युग में हम देख रहे हैं कि हमारी हर इंफॉर्मेशन हर एक के पास है आज हम जूम पर बात कर रहे हैं तो कल ये सारी की सारी जो हमारी बातचीत है किसी वेबसाइट पर उपलब्ध होगी ऐसा भी संभव है और जितना हमारे पास फेसबुक में हमारा डाटा है वो कहीं ना कहीं किसी किसी बाजार में पंद्रह पैसे में बिक रहा हो यानी हर जगह हर प्रकार की इस प्रकार से हमारी खुली है हम हमेशा सरकार से ये कहते रहे हैं टिकटॉक का जब हमने विरोध किया हमने सरकार से कहा कि आप जितनी भी एप्स प्ले स्टोर पर या एप स्टोर पर अवेलेबल है या किसी भी माध्यम से वो डाउनलोड की जा सकती हैं, वो देश के कानूनों को माने तब जाकर के आपको उनको अनुमति दी जानी चाहिए लेकिन सरकार उसमें सोई हुई है और ये हमारे जितने मित्र हैं नियम बताने वाले वो सब भी वहां पर चुप हैं, कोई नहीं बोल रहा आरोग्य सेतु ऐप आने पर हमने उसके बारे में अध्ययन करना शुरू किया वो मैं उनका धन्यवाद करता हूँ कि वास्तव में हमारी जो डाटा सिक्योरिटी है पर्सनल सिक्योरिटी है उसको हमें मेंटेन करना चाहिए मेरा आ, उन सब मित्रों से एक ये भी पूछना है कि कब आ, सरकार ने आ, ये कहा है कि हम इसको इस डाटा को बेच देंगे लेकिन वो लोग तो बेच रहे हैं सरकार जो भी इसका इन, इस्तेमाल करेगी वो लोगों के हित के लिए करने के लिए ये बनाई गई है और यदि यदि ब्लूटूथ और जीपीएस के के संदर्भ में जो बात की जा रही है अगर ये इस प्रकार की ऐप ना बने तो आप कैसे इंश्योर करेंगे कि जो चाइनीज वायरस से संक्रमित व्यक्ति है वो किस गेट से निकला है अगर जीपीएस उसमें नहीं होगा तो किस गेट से निकला है और उस गेट के के बारे में उसको सैनिटाइज करना पड़ेगा उस क्षेत्र को सैनिटाइज करना पड़ेगा ये कैसे पता चलेगा यानी जो भी इस ऐप में आवश्यक चीजें हैं वो इसमें डाली गई हैं। लेकिन मैं सब मित्रों से पूछना चाहता हूँ कि टिकटॉक में ऐसी जितनी इंफॉर्मेशन मांगी जाती है सामान्य एप्स में उससे पैंतालीस ज्यादा मानी जाती है हम जब टिकटॉक को बंद करने की बात करते हैं तो ये सभी मित्र हमारे जितने भी लोग हैं जो फ्रीडम ऑफ स्पीच की बात करते हैं वो आएंगे कि अरे आप फ्रीडम ऑफ स्पीच को भंग कर रहे हैं हम उनको कहते हैं कि भैया ये फ्रीडम ऑफ स्पीच नहीं है फ्रीडम ऑफ स्पीच भी कहीं लिमिटेशंस के साथ इस संविधान में उपलब्ध कराई गई है वो फ्रीडम ऑफ स्पीच नहीं होती जब आप किसी कॉम्युनिटीज को के, के बीच में झगड़ा कराने की कोशिश करें सोशल डिसहार्मनी क्रिएट करने की कोशिश करें मेरा ये मानना है कि यह जो ऐप है एक निश्चित उद्देश्य से एक निश्चित समय में एक एक, एक कालखंड के लिए बनाई गई है और देश के आ, और ये आ, सबसे अच्छी बात ये है कि अभी तक तो हम विदेशी ऐप्स विदेशियों के संदर्भ में ही सारी बातें विचार किया करते थे हम हमेशा कहते हैं एक देशी जूम होना चाहिए एक देशी व्हाट्सएप होना चाहिए एक देशी फेसबुक होना चाहिए और अब अब अगर एक देशी ऐप आरोग्य सेतु ऐप आई है तो स्वाभाविक तौर पर ये राष्ट्रीय हितों के संरक्षण से होगा अगर ये चीनी होती अगर ये अमेरिकन होती तो हम कोई कुछ नहीं कहने वाले थे लेकिन अब भारतीय है तो मुझे लगता है कि हर जब भी स्वदेशी की बात आती है तो कहीं ना कहीं हम उस पर प्रश्न खड़ा करना शुरू करते हैं मेरा ये कहना है कि ये प्रश्न जरूर खड़े करें लेकिन वो प्रश्न सब सब के साथ खड़े होने चाहिए और आज हमें अपने देश के हितों के संरक्षण की जरूरत है आपने रोहन जी ने कहा 
उस संरक्षण के लिए जरूरी है कि जितनी भी विदेशी एप्स हैं उनसे ये सुनिश्चित करवाया जाए कि वो भारतीय नियमों का भारतीय कानूनों का पालन करें अनुपालन करें चाहे वो टिकटॉक है चाहे वो हेलो है चाहे वो ऐप व्हाट्सएप भी है चाहे वो फेसबुक भी है वो सभी जो एप्स हैं या वेबसाइट्स हैं वो भारतीय नियमों का अनुपालन करें देश के विकास में सहयोगी हों देश में बीमारी न बढ़े उसके उसके लिए मददगार हों आरोग्य सेतु ऐप उसी संदर्भ में एक स्वागत योग्य कदम है मैं उनका स्वागत धन्यवाद अश्विनी जी एनी डिस्कशन ऑन द आरोग्य सेतु ऐप वुड बी इनकम्प्लीट विदाउट अंडरस्टैंडिंग इट्स यूटिलिटी ऑन द इकोनॉमिक फॉल आउट विच इज लाइकली टू बी फेल्ट आई वुड लाइक टू इन्वाइट डॉक्टर आमिर उल्ला खान to discuss how the arogya setu app could be beneficial to reduce the economic fallout of covid-19 and how it could potentially help us in opening up the economy at a faster pace dr amir ullah khan please thank you rohan uh, it's been wonderful following this uh, this great conversation today uh, some very good friends some who i i, I don't know yet but wonderful to hear all of you uh particularly great seeing pavan back after some time um uh, let me quickly go through uh four points that i would like to make here given that i have 170 seconds left um my first point is that what uh, the app uh, seeks to do and what the app was uh, set up for uh according to me is very clear the app was set up for contact tracing now uh, you know it's always useful in economic policy to know why you are uh, initiating a policy intervention uh, it is when you don't know that that all hell breaks loose so uh, in the arogya setu app the clear cut objective as far as i understand is to see to trace how uh, how any potential person um, is going through his or her contacts great uh, move because that's the key to all testing that we are at, uh, advocating for to see that we are able to very efficiently use our limited capacities to test and reach out to the maximum numbers there is no arguing against the fact that it is testing alone that is going to help us uh, fight this battle so as far as that is concerned uh, we are very clear here is something that allows us to establish the 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 route that uh, a person has taken great problem start when um, and this is the first point i want to make the problem starts when one we become we we start looking at technology as the destination and i'm afraid that that is one thing that becomes uh, a, a perennial problem in any Uh, in any economic policy decision for example i'm just reminded of uh, the last problem that we had you know the last big problem that we had uh, which again i was very much a part of was uh, in fighting hiv uh, big problem millions of people affected we didn't know what it was where it was going we didn't have any capacity to test people we had nothing called a naco in the ministry of health so we were exactly where we were on january 31st this year what did we do you know among the various things we did uh, we came up with a smart card for hiv the point i'm making is that you know at that time 10 15 years ago the fad was smart cards so any problem and you made a smart card there was a smart card for the road transport corporation a star smart card for the rsby a smart card for the epo one didn't know why we were making so many smart cards to collect the same information the arguments were exactly the same what pavan talked about today were all the issues that we discussed 15 years ago nothing has changed and we haven't done anything in the last 15 years to address any of those issues before going on to the next technology which is this app why am i worried about about apps you see we have and i was doing a little count you know we have the narendra modi mobile app we have a raksha app we have a pmo india app we have a my gov app we have a swachh bharat toilet locator app which has a full 1000 downloads right uh, we have a kisan suvidha app you know you you have 
farmers in trouble so the answer is make an app for them that is you know that's the problem that's the first problem i want to highlight that you know solutions don't come because you think that the technology is a solution so therefore we have to be careful of this that we are not building an app simply because an app is what everybody should be doing uh, the 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 solution is not the app the app is just a minor part of the solution second problem that comes with with issues like this is a little more than the privacy that uh, we have just been discussing it's not just about privacy you see it's not about protecting my information you know my information is available as mr mahajan just said you know whenever i go on twitter or on whatsapp or whatever everything about me and my dog everybody knows but that is not the problem the problem here is that here we are dealing with a very sensitive issue of health you know the health data is not like any other data it's not the, it's not like the data about what i buy and what i sell it is really about how i'm going to get treated in our society unfortunately and one has to call a spade a shovel um, it is a fact that we suffer from acute stigma we are a society that is you know that is ready to lynch anybody and in that if we make any kind of sensitive data available it we have to do it with utmost precaution it is not like any other country we are a different country in that we already see people using asking uh, asking at at colony gates whether you have an arogya setu app to be able to enter the colony and this kind of vigilant vigilantism can emerge if we push this app like we are pushing right now the final point i want to make is that in any of these technology issues you always have something which is called a scope creep you know in all all economic policy we see you add one more thing it is doing abcd let's do e also so therefore what do we do now look at the arogya setu app what was it it was a good thing to start with it was contact tracing now what have we done we have added e passes to it what does it have to do with the contact tracing we have now even added donation to pm cares you see there can be no end to where we will go if we keep adding and that and that's very seductive you have an app that has a million people downloading put everything onto it that is what we have to be careful about look at the army you know the army has clearly said i i'm quoting a couple of news uh, items it said army men will not download our this it is not secure so therefore the big point i want to make is that as far as the app's original purpose is concerned which is of tracing contacts it is a very uh, efficient step if it is if it is restricted to that great anything more we have a huge problem on our hands thank you thank you very much dr khan uh, i'd now like to ask mr anil bhardwaj who is secretary general of fismi a leading msme association in india how is the arogya setu app useful for small businesses sir how is it useful for msmes to open up shop during this time is it you see i i am not an expert on the issue but what i do feel is that there is a good possibility that it could be used as an instrument or as a tool to help comply some of the conditions that uh factories msmes have to comply with in view of the mha guidelines for example in tracking and tracing and for example issuing e passes for the workers to come and report and maybe uh, tomorrow i don't know uh, but maybe it could be decided or a feature could be added uh, to this tool whereby all the workers of a particular factory could form a small group within that and uh, specific uh, other services could be provided to that sub group so uh, in in this context i think uh, there is a good potential for this tool to be used because at the same time why i am saying is uh, that currently there is lot of subjectivity in decision making and in compliance of uh, uh, the mha guidelines particularly by the local authorities so we are looking for uh, such tools or such uh, mechanism that the approach becomes little more objective and there is little chance for the local authorities because as you know we are uh, living in a world where the at the ground level the cops are trigger happy and all officials once they are given the powers with hammers in their hands so they look for uh, the head of a nail everywhere to strike so uh, we were just looking uh, uh, it as a tool to maybe uh, use uh, or to perhaps uh, induce little more objectivity 
in the decision making. This is what uh, limited extent that I see from the perspective of MSMEs. Uh, but great to see Amir. <laughs> uh, I hope every, everybody is fine in the family there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Anil Bhagwad. Uh, we have in our midst Dr. Shefali Dash, who's a senior technologist and former director general of the National Informatics Center, NIC, who also is a senior fellow with Scotch Development Foundation. May I, at this stage of the discussion, please invite Dr. Shefali Dash to uh, share her views on the app. And there is also a poll which will be coming up on your screens. This poll is a survey which is being conducted for the panel. Uh, I'd be most grateful if you could fill out and vote for this survey. Uh, thanks, Rohan. Uh, I had just uh, posted my uh, two questions, one question and one suggestion to uh, uh, Arnav, because this is regarding development. See, actually, I am very happy with the Aragusatu application, which I downloaded almost in the first week of its launch. Okay, probably because I knew about it earlier than most people. Uh, but my, my suggestion is that, that this is basically on the presumption that most of the people are using this, uh, using a smartphone, and then on top of that, they are always carrying it with them, with the Bluetooth on, which may or may not be true. And then that makes your um, catchment area for data collection very uh, small. How will you handle this issue? And second thing, second thing is a suggestion. I just wanted to uh, make it. Um, it looks Arugusetu is only for people to give their information but nothing they get in return. Though it says notify notification will come only when you come in contact with a COVID positive person, but that, that will come, I don't know when, because the spread is really not that high compared to our population. In that case, uh, we see a lot of uh, maps come, coming out in paper. So it is not a very uh, sensitive data, which gives you loca localities which are uh, red, green, uh, and uh, orange. So if that kind of a map for a particular area, if that is sent to the user, maybe in a district or a state, uh, then the user will think that, yes, I'm getting something out of it. As of now, um, I don't say, I mean, the user doesn't get anything. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Das. Uh, if I were to circle back to Mr. Arnav Kumar, would you like to respond to some of these questions? Would you like to share your perspectives at the end of the discussion, Mr. Kumar? Uh, absolutely, absolutely, and thank you very much. Uh, now, now I'm in office, so using a mask. My, my apologies for that. Uh, see, uh, uh, I uh, bear with me for like ten seconds. I need to just. Yeah, my apologies. I was just closing the room. So there are three things that I wanted to say. First of all, I want to say thank you for the former DG and IC, ma'am. Uh, thank you for pointing out those questions. Uh, you will be pleased to know that this is all in collaboration with an IC, etc. Uh, the first, the question that you asked whether we are giving more information. This is something that everybody should understand and appreciate. Uh, based on the self-assessment, at this point in time, uh, we have got uh, a more than about a lakh people who may be who may have given different signals that needs to be acted upon further. Ayushman Bharat has already started making calls to people to see whether they are doing okay or not in these times of emergencies. Uh, and this is, this is the central thesis of what we are trying to do. This is what you see in your hands is a UI UX product. What is happening in the background is something that we all are very proud of, making sure that every citizen who may be in the time of need at this point in time is proactively being uh, given the help that they need. This is the importance. And, and if you don't trust me, you'll see several reviews, et cetera, on Facebook, et cetera, where people are saying that I had put cough as a symptom. A doctor called me and said whether you are doing okay or not, whether you need a medical intervention or not. That is the first point. My second point is to everybody who has given, uh, who has given various clauses, et cetera, about the app, et cetera. And I say this, I'm not a seasoned bureaucrat. I came from the private sector three years ago. I'm not a seasoned uh, communicator. So what I say is with, with a lot of sincerity and with a lot of naivety, the product was built within two and a half weeks with 70 volunteers uh, taking out time from their job working 24 seven. Uh, if you thought this was not a perfect product, an early beta was uh, given to you to test it. And then my phone number, my email address is a public information. Uh, 
you could have reached out to us and say hey look this does not look correct can you try uh, correcting this rather than writing long stories and reports in the public domain and impacting the utility of this product we could have done this collaboratively in the spirit of you saying that we are all in this together let's try to be in this together and and help india have a product if you think that this kind of product is not needed at all that's a different thing or whether you think that we do not need to know do automatic tracing through technology that's a different thing but if you think that there is an iota of a uh, benefit in this product let's do this together rather than we, it's becoming you versus us so that that's the second part and then my third request to everybody is that uh, we we do understand the point of scope creep and we are very very conscious that's what that was my opening statement we are not going to put features which not make sense features that make sense are features like telemedicine etc which we are putting together uh, uh, features like informing you what are your hot spots etc we are putting all of that dot uh, here on the app in a in a systemic manner what you need to appreciate is that whatever we do we have to make sure that we do in 12 languages we do not open any privacy or security concerns and we keep expanding on the on the product so the expectations that you may have we may be falling short of that expectation in in continuously churning out the kind of product that we eventually want uh, nobody is under the illusion that this is a perfect product and we are constantly working on improving it we need your support to make it a product that actually helps us break the chain with that spirit try to work with us rather than making it us against them kind of a situation thank you thank you very much mr kumar and if i were to quickly sum up the discussion i think this was a fantastic learning exercise uh, we had uh, siddharth deb speak about the terms of service and the privacy policy and some concerns therein we had ms pratibha jain talk about how that privacy policy not limiting which arms of government can access this data is a concern and she also argued that there might be a slight vacuum in terms of legal arguments backed in constitutional law surrounding the app uh, tushar sanu mentioned that breach of data is something which is not exclusive and this might be a tool in the hands of frontline workers devadatt mukhopadhyay of the internet freedom foundation spoke about separation of powers and need for parliamentary oversight and scrutiny and a sunset clause mr s n pradhan spoke about the fallacy of finality and how privacy is not an absolute right it is co-located earlier on in the discussion we had mr prashant sugathan uh, talk about uh, some of the ramifications legal and privacy which uh, Uh, could potentially be raised by the app uh, we had dr pavan duggal talk to us about cyber legal ramification and encryption standards for the app major general narendra kumar asked whether or not gps is possible uh, dr ashwini mahajan raised some specific concerns on specified time and specified purpose dr amirullah khan spoke to us today about three things technology technology cannot be the destination privacy is a myth and scope creep mr anil bhardwaj presented a potential use case for uh, SMEs uh, through the Arogya Setu app. Ms. Dr. Ashwini Mahajan, I see a hand raised there, sir. Would you like to ask a question at this stage of the discussion before we close? Yeah, I just wanted to make a point that uh, we are we are talking about uh, government surveillance, and uh, this app can help government in surveil uh, for the surveillance. But I must tell you that uh, any information on any app, whether it's WhatsApp or it's facebook or twitter or any any uh, any online uh, uh, server the government can always ask for any information about the number of people or for the whole population at any point of time the only thing this app does is that it does it does provide the government the direct access that's all otherwise government has got the power to get any information from any of these apps therefore therefore uh, uh, we we can't uh, say that gov government should not be allowed to they are already uh, have have the power to access the, this information from anybody thank you very much and before we close uh, i noticed that there are some questions which have been raised in the chat uh, uh, one question which is primarily to mr arnab kumar from hemant pothula is well it's a three part question really is the data currently being generated being analyzed and who will have access to these analysis reports will this be made public the second part is please define professionals who have or will have access to this data at central or state government levels and is there any scope for an oversight mechanism as ms mukhopadhyay mentioned uh, would you like to address this before we take up quickly one or two further questions which are there on the chat yeah sure so see uh, 
we, we have a dashboard uh, which powers all the intelligence and all the proactive measures that we are taking. Uh, again, I said, said this in my, my opening statement, the access to uh, this dashboard is on a need to know basis only to people who are directly involved in COVID-19 medical interventions only. Uh, and nobody else. We have a log of who is getting access and who is downloading even a single piece of information from the dashboard. Everything is made available through an, an IC secure VPN tunnel. We are not do, we are not going crazy with the data. We are making very very sure that only the person who can act on the information gets the information and nobody else. That we are very very sure of. Uh, the other two questions. Uh, let's park this for uh, for a longer discussion because. Uh, this gets into the structure, blah, blah, blah. My simple answer to that is that there's already a high power, high empowered committee on COVID-19 uh, looking at data and intelligence for uh, against COVID-19. And then this app is is under their domain to, to do the uh, governance mechanisms, et cetera. So there's already a set of people whom, whom we report to. Uh, and and it, it has been very well flagged and publicized in the public domain. Uh, I see I see two more hands from the panelists pool raised, uh, Mr. Tushar Sanu and then Dr. Ashwini Mahajan. No. So, so there is there is a question from Mr. Arup Dasgupta. And the question says that, uh, what about Bluetooth security? Is having Bluetooth on and discoverable recommended at all times? And he also asks, no one talked about the proposal to integrate Arugya Setu with Survey of India's Sehyog and put the data on SOI maps. Uh, is this not a security risk? On, on the second part, I have no comments. I do not know where that information has come from. Uh, I am not working on it. On the first part, uh, Bluetooth contract tracing is, is, is a contact tracing through Bluetooth is an integral part of it. Uh, we have done our security audit so that we are not, uh, we don't expose people to unnecessary security vulnerabilities. Uh, I'm not the technical expert on Bluetooth or Bluetooth low energy to tell you that if you keep it on all the time, can <laughs> malware attack you or not. I would assume that we have this on Android and Google. So uh, Android and iOS, so they have inherent features to make sure that if people have Bluetooth on, uh, these kind of uh, attacks are not made. I have my Bluetooth on since, 17th March, the, the day we started writing the first code uh, for this app, and even before that, and I haven't seen anything. Thank you very much. I see Mr. Susar yes. Sanu's hand raised there. Is there Please. something that you would like to add? Yes, yes, so, yes. So, Rohan, I would just like to make a comment, and it's a pertinent comment. You know, considering the global scenario, almost most of the countries, China, South Korea, who have been partially successful in containing this. Uh, this this coronavirus and uh, uh, you know opening the lockdown so to speak have primarily relied on these apps which are in fact more invasive number one number two is that if you you know follow the news i i i've read recently that even the even google and apple are coming out with a contact tracing system in which they will you know uh, empower specific apps to in fact do contract tracing through Bluetooth. Now they are saying that they will come up with that contact tracing system somewhere in May and somewhere, you know, even later. And that too, primarily for the United States. And then probably it will come to India. Here, I believe Kaniti Ayog and the government of India must receive, uh, um, you know, multiple commendations to come out with something so quickly, which will ensure that life can get back on track as soon as possible. And, uh, you know, without in fact, uh, uh, allowing any foreign multinational corporations to control this data. Number two is, you know, Dr. Arnab has very categorically and, you know, uh, very lucidly stated that uh, and given examples of uh, TikTok, Facebook, uh, uh, you know, WhatsApp, and how they are, uh, you know, in fact, in possession of our data and, uh, you know, uh, to what uses they might be uh, putting our data to. And uh, I believe something as critical as public health cannot be compromised with or cannot be dealt with, uh, you know, lightly. And hence, uh, I, I, you know, Niti Ayok and Government of India and Arogya Setu need to be commended. And in fact, I believe maximum people should download it. And that is the way forward. Right. That is it. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm sorry, but that's really all that we have time for at this stage. The next session begins in 25 minutes. 
uh, thank you so very much thank to you. each and every one of you for taking the time out and being with us here today. Uh, thank you for such an interactive and great learning experience. Thank you so much. It has been a pleasurable experience. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, everyone. Thank you.